next speaker is uh, Professor Nimar Kanyamed from the Institute for Advanced Study. Nima. Uh, Can you guys all hear me okay? Yes, yes. All right, wonderful. All right, well, um, it's really uh, an uh, enormous uh, honor to uh, uh, speak at this uh, wonderful uh, occasion uh, here today. The uh, organizers uh, tasked me uh, to talk about uh, two aspects of um, uh, Steve's incredible body of work on uh, two different aspects on gravity as an effective field theory and the uh, cosmological constant. Uh, these are two different topics, but I was uh, in, in any case most delighted with my charge since uh, these do represent uh, um, aspects of, of Weinberg's work which have had the biggest impact on the arc of my own uh, research over the past uh, 20 years. Um, as we all know, Weinberg loved to ask simple and deep questions, uh, perhaps prime amongst them, why is nature described by quantum field theory? And he was also a great unifier. He famously disliked the Einsteinian view of gravity as curvature of space-time, uh, feeling that it gave gravity too privileged a position relative to the other interactions as giving the arena in which everything takes place, um, uh, and uh, feeling that this erected an artificial barrier uh, towards seeing a deeper unity between gravity and the other interactions. So this led him to a point of view about gravity as an effective field theory, much like other effective field theories uh, describing massless particles of spin two uh, in flat space. Um, and this was more generally part of a, is very deep, and I imagine for the time, highly unusual reimagining of the foundations of and even the raison d'etre of uh, quantum field theory itself, asserting the primacy of relativity quantum mechanics and the notion of particles as a starting point. So that's where we're gonna start the uh, story. So if we ask the question, why quantum field theory? Of course, the, 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 the most obvious uh, uh, textbook answer I imagine from the middle part of the century would have been because we see classical field theories in nature and we should quantize them, but Weinberg was dissatisfied with this. And he um, uh, uh, promulgated a point of view, um, especially in his uh, field theory books, um, which is that quantum fields offer the most useful formalism to, to describe fundamentally particles that have local interactions satisfying, as we've discussed already, cluster decomposition and so on. Um, and this, this has a much uh, stronger feeling of inevitability about it. Whatever the underlying um, uh, uh, theory of the world is, so long as it has relativity and quantum mechanics at low enough energies, long enough distances, it's guaranteed to be described by a quantum field theory. But uh, it's a notion of particle that is primary here. We're trying to describe the consistently the interactions of particles and uh, local fields are a convenient tool for doing that. So as Weinberg does, and really going back to Wigner, the, uh, we begin with the very simple question, what is a particle? Um, and most abstractly, a particle is a unitary uh, irrep of the Poincaré group. Um, uh, the, the intuitive idea of a particle, like an electron here being the same as the electron there and in other places, um, uh, and rotated, the spins rotated in different ways and moving at, di at different velocities, the fact that we give them all the same name electron <laughs> is a reflection of the space-time symmetries. So we have the space-time symmetries that have to be implemented in a unitary way on a Hilbert space because of quantum mechanics. Um, and so you can imagine that, 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 that a particle just by diagonalizing translations um, uh, uh, is characterized by giving some energy and, uh, and uh, momentum satisfying the on-shell uh, mass condition. Um, and it can have some other labels too, sigma, and uh, we can uh, start from some reference momentum and define all other reference momenta by some canonical boost that takes us from uh, K to P. Uh, and we can use the unitary um, uh, 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 representation of that special boost uh, to define what I mean by the other labels that the particle might have other than uh, other than uh, its uh, momenta. But once you do that, you're stuck. And if you take a general unitary transformation corresponding to a general Lorentz transformation on a general state, you will mix these indices up with each other in general, and they will transform under not the Lorentz group, but the action of the Lorentz group and is intuitively clear where uh, corresponds to those Lorentz transformations that leave the momentum of the particle invariant. Okay, so 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 and and those are what correspond to the additional degrees of freedom, the spin degrees of freedom, which transform not under Lorentz transformations but under the little group, uh, Wigner's little group of the Lorentz transformations. So um, uh, now. Uh, 
So that's what particles are. Now we we imagine that we have some uh, some some particles interaction, some some in some in states of particles, out states of particles, and here is the logic that. Uh, uh, that lets us, uh, that leads us to fields. We begin by just trying to label all of the states um, of, uh, of various particles. We define raising and lowering operators. This just defines them as ways of um, uh, simply characterizing uh, uh, operators in this Hilbert space. Now, crucially, uh, we want to build some interaction Hamiltonian so that the scattering processes involving these elementary particles satisfy the very minimal notion of locality that goes into cluster decomposition, which, uh, which very precisely says that if I look at the connected part of the uh, scattering amplitude for a bunch of particles, there should only be one overall delta function for momentum conservation. I shouldn't have two different pieces of delta function for momentum conservation, which would uh, products of two different pieces that would uh, that would tell us that what's going on here is not uncorrelated with what's going on arbitrarily far away. And in order to do that, you have to build uh, the interaction Hamiltonian as an integral over something local over space of some Hamiltonian density. And in order for these things to, to transform nicely under the symmetries, translations, and so on, we should build uh, uh, functions of position. These fields, phi plus or minus out of a position that I make from, um, from uh, taking linear combinations of the A's and the A daggers. So that's why uh, fields are useful for describing the local interactions of particles. And this, this much has nothing to do with the Lorentz invariance. Finally, with Lorentz invariance, um, uh, in order for time evolution in one frame to actually give us the same answer for the S matrix as doing things in any different frame, uh, we have to have the, the time orderings and the definition of the uh, perturbative expansion of the S matrix don't matter, which forces that the Hamiltonian density should commute with itself outside the light cone, which in turn tells you that the Hamiltonian density uh, has to be built out of those particular combinations of phi plus and phi minus that we normally identify as relativistic quantum fields, giving us a notion of antiparticle spin statistics and so on. All right, so that's the, that's the sort of rough logic. We're trying to describe the uh, local interactions of particles and we use fields as the convenient way of doing it. Now, the moment we have particles with spin, life gets a little bit more interesting because the amplitude itself only has little group indices. The amplitude does not transform like a Lorentz tensor. If you do a Lorentz transformation on the momenta, you have to pick up a little group transformation on the, uh, on the uh, little group indices. What we, however, compute with fields are things that are Lorentz tensors. So here's an example of uh, what we do with massive, uh, with the uh, spin one fields, for example. So in order to go from one to the other, we also have to have polarization vectors, which are objects that sort of convert between Lorentz and little group indices. And we can think of, again, intuitively as putting the fields that we see on the right-hand side on shell to get the actual uh, amplitudes of the particles on the left-hand side. And this is all well and good, except uh, for the very well-known, but also very important and dramatic difference between massless and massive particles. The degrees of freedom for massless and massive particles, the structure of the little group for massless and uh, massive particles uh, with spin. Um, uh, the, uh, the massive little group in D space-time dimensions is just D minus one dimensional rotations, but the massless little group is D minus two dimensional rotations. Um, that's the intuitive fact that a spin one particle, for example, a massive W, um, no matter how it's moving, you can go to a frame where it's at rest and you can tilt your head and see it uh, spin in all three different possible ways. In a general spin S particle is 2S plus one degrees of freedom, but you can't do that with a massless particle. You can't uh, catch up with it. Um, and so all we can talk about, the only spin degrees of freedom that it has is helicity, the spin in the direction of motion. Um, so really fundamentally only one degree of freedom is forced on you for a massless particle of spin. If you have a parity, even in some approximation, it's two because you should be able to see it uh, both uh, both uh, helicities. So this dramatic difference between the number of degrees of freedom of massless and massive is an extra challenge for the field description. And we can see that very simply in the structure of the polarization vectors. If we start with spin one, for example, epsilon mu, of course, is four degrees of freedom. If I want to describe the three degrees of freedom of a massive spin one, I can do that by imposing epsilon dot p equals zero. That gives me three degrees of freedom. That's good, uh, but if I have massless spin one, I just can't do that. There's simply no Lorentz invariant way uh, 
of getting down to the two degrees of freedom associated with a massless spin one particle. And if you make some arbitrary choice for how to label the two polarizations for the massless spin one particle, if you do a Lorentz transformation that leaves a momentum invariant, you'll see that uh, you won't come back to the same form of the polarization vector and it'll instead shift by something proportional to the momentum itself. Therefore, if we want to use this strategy of lo using local quantum fields to describe the interactions of these particles, we have to introduce a new idea. We have to declare a redundancy that helicity states are labeled by equivalent classes of polarization vectors that are shifted proportional to the momentum. This is what the shift looks like for spin one. This is what it looks like for spin two. Of course, we can uh, recognize these as linearized gauge transformations or linearized diffeomorphisms. But from this point of view, they're just sort of forced on us uh, simply by uh, trying to describe the correct number of uh, degrees of freedom. Now, this redundancy means that there's a huge constraint on whatever uh, the, the Feynman amplitudes are uh, for massless particles with spin. If we're supposed to get the same answer, no matter which representative in this equivalence class uh, we choose, then the amplitudes would better be invariant if I shift the polarization vector proportional to their momentum. And so for massless spin one, we have to have this constraint that P mu dotted into M mu with any other indices is equal to zero. For spin two, similarly, again, P mu dotted into M mu nu with any other indices should equal zero. Um, and uh, from a from the conventional approach, these are the onshell word identities, but, uh, and in the conventional textbook way of thinking about these, these come out pretty late in the development. From this point of view, um, they're primary uh, because they're what's necessary in order to make sure that despite appearances, uh, um, the amplitudes are actually physically Lorentz invariant. The mu nus are, are good Lorentz tensors, um, but the polarization vectors are not. Only these equivalence uh, classes are Lorentz invariant objects. And so this is what's necessary in order uh, to, to consistently describe the, uh, the reduced number of degrees of freedom for massless particles with spin. In Weinberg's hands, uh, this turned into astonishingly restrictive and powerful statements um, of the Weinberg soft theorems. And the Weinberg soft theorems tell us about all consistent possible long range forces. So Weinberg started with the idea to imagine you have n particle scattering, but with an n plus, uh, with, with one additional uh, particle, um, which has a, a massless particle with some spin s and some momentum q. And the question is, what could the leading amplitude look like as q goes to zero? Now, um, it's, it's possible for the amplitude to have a singularity as q goes to zero. Uh, and the only places it could have a singularity are where the, uh, or, or, or where the massless particle is attached to an, an, an external lock. Uh, that's because the sort of propagator here has a one over P plus Q squared minus M squared, um, which, uh, which is just a one over uh, P dot Q. So we can have singularities coming from when the particles are attached to the external leg. And so what can the leading possible behavior look like? Well, so uh, here I've written down what it could look like for particles of spin one, two, um, uh, potentially particles of mass of spin one, two, three, and higher. Um, and so let's say for spin one, I'm just giving a name to the coupling EI here. And here we make a very important assumption that we put in the leading possible coupling. So we want the largest coupling that we can have, the one that's going to give us a long range, uh, that can conceivably give us a long range force. And therefore we want to have as many powers of the hard particle momenta as we can. So that's why there's a momentum uh, uh, sitting up here. Um, so in all this discussion, we're talking about these leading couplings. And okay, so here's, here's the leading coupling that we can have for spin one. Uh, for spin two, I can have two hard momenta upstairs contracted into an epsilon nu nu. Spin three, three hard momenta contracted to an epsilon nu nu sigma and so on. So, um, so that's what the leading behavior can possibly look like independent of any other uh, details. But now there's a very big check that we have uh, to do. We have to check invariance under the shift of the polarization vector by something proportional to its momentum, which in practice just means that we contract one of these indices into the corresponding momentum. So we have to have, therefore, that for the massless spin one case, that zero is equal to what we had before, where I take one of the, uh, the one of the indices of the epsilon and I dot it into P. So in this case, I just get the, the hard momentum PI dot Q over PI dot Q. That just gives me the sum of all the charges. So I learned strikingly that just consistency tells me that I have to have charge conservation. Massless spin two is the most interesting case 
Um, now, if I have the uh, coupling, so the massless spin two particle, the various couplings are kappa i. Uh, now, my effective charge has an extra momentum in it. So the charge conservation, now um, the, the effective charge is, is these kappa i times the momentum. So now I have to have that the sum of all these kappa i pi is equal to zero. And that naively seems impossible because I already have a constraint that all the momenta have to add up to zero. If I put a random linear combination of the momenta also having to add up to zero, that puts too many constraints on the kinematics. So the amplitude would have to vanish except for very special uh, con uh, uh, possible configurations. And the only way to avoid that is if all the kappas are equal to each other. So that's a remarkable thing that if you have a massless spin two particle, all of its couplings have to be universal. This is the discovery of the principle of equivalence, um, but only from the consistency of special relativity and quantum mechanics. If we, uh, if we move on to the next case of massless spin three, now the effective charge is some rho i, but now something quadratic in the momenta. And now it is impossible in, in it, uh, beyond one plus one dimensions. In one plus one dimensions, uh, of course, something very special happens because the, the particles are just, uh, uh, just uh, uh, invert their uh, momentum. The kinematics is so degenerate. But in higher dimensions, it's simply impossible to impose both momentum conservation as well as this quadratic constraint on the momenta and not force the momenta to only uh, take certain uh, uh, discrete um, uh, set of possible values. So we learn that we cannot have long range forces mediated by particles of uh, massless spin th uh, three and higher. If we do have uh, long range forces mediated by massless spin one particles, they have to have something like charge conservation, massless spin two particles have to have the principle, have to have universal coupling and the principle of the equivalence. And you can follow on from this uh, logic um, uh, uh, by, by looking at the huge constraint imposed by these on-shell word identities uh, to show that the only way that you can make objects that satisfy those on-shell word identities is to have them come from underlying Lagrangians that have nonlinear, general nonlinear Yang null symmetries, the general nonlinear uh, uh, diffs all forced on you by simply requiring these linearized uh, uh, gate symmetries and the linearized diffs associated with the on-shell word identities. So, all right, so that's, uh, that's um, uh, uh, and, uh, and I should say that, um, as Edward also mentioned, in recent years, the weinberg soft theorem, just, uh, in four dimensions especially, have been, uh, uh, been interpreted as, as associated with infinitely many symmetries on the, uh, in, in thinking about amplitude that's associated with points on the celestial sphere, uh, the, the, the two-dimensional surface that, the, that any observer would see on the sort of night sky uh, looking around. Now, uh, uh, that uh, sort of a uh, review of Weinberg's way of uh, thinking about these things, um, but I can't resist saying a little bit, I'll just uh, uh, flash through this quickly just to give an, an, an impression um, uh, because it's, it's directly inspired by the sort of uh, Weinbergian way of thinking. Um, but I want to tell you something about the sort of modern on-shell way of understanding uh, uh, these things directly thinking about the uh, on-shell amplitudes. And this entire program is really directly inspired by Weinberg to focus on on-shell amplitudes crucially with the correct little group transformation properties. But there's a very fateful early departure, which is, um, which is to not transition to thinking about local quantum fields. So uh, you don't talk about local quantum fields you don't ever see a polarization vector. You don't ever see these gauge redundancies. Um, the space-time symmetries are made manifest at the outset. The correct little group transformation properties in particular are made manifest at the outset. But of course, the price in this program is that you, is, is you have to check, manually check, that the objects that you're writing down are consistent with locality and unitary. And, uh, and I just want to uh, at least give the sort of logical structure of, of how this way of thinking works. Um, to begin with, you uh, uh, introduce a set of variables that, that manifest the action of the symmetries uh, um, as transparently as possible. Uh, for example, in four dimensions, we can go from a four vector to the two by two matrix by dotting into poly matrices in the usual way. Um, uh, and if the particle is massless, uh, this two by two matrix is vanishing determinant, so uh, uh, so it's rank one. So we can write p alpha alpha dot as an outer product of two two dimensional vectors, lambda alpha and lambda tilde alpha dot. Often this is sort of just presented as a kind of a cool trick for introducing these spinner helicity variables, but it's not a trick 
it, the point is that it's these objects that transform properly under the Lorentz and Little group, um, because there is an obvious invariance here under rescaling lambda and lambda tilde by, uh, by opposite uh, factors, which leaves the momentum invariance. And this is precisely the action of the Little group. So that uh, if you give me an object, if, if I have a particle of helicity H, it means that if you give me an amplitude, if you give me a function of lambda and lambda tilde, it has to have a particular scaling if you rescale lambda and lambda tilde oppositely, uh, given by its by its helicity, and that's it. Once you do that, you have something that manifestly has the correct uh, little group and uh, 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 Lorentz transformation properties, with no need for redundancy in polarization vectors. Okay, so, so that's the that's the conceptually important thing about the um, uh, about the uh, spinner helicity variables. And then you can go on from there. I won't go through this in uh, detail. Um, uh, maybe the most uh, the two important things uh, to say is that first, the kinematics of three particle scattering is so constrained that uh, you can completely determine the three particle amplitudes up to the overall strength of the interaction um, just by symmetries. Okay? So, so uh, three particle amplitudes are entirely determined by, uh, by asymmetries. Um, this lets you discover various uh, fascinating things. For example, the leading three particle amplitude, for let's say you have all uh, particles with uh, spin curly S, the leading uh, three particle amplitudes uh, have two of them uh, with minus helicity and, and one of them with plus helicity or the other way around. There's a subleading one where all of them have um, uh, a negative helicity or all of them have positive helicity. Those in a conventional language would correspond to higher dimension operators, but the leading ones that uh, 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 that we would associate with the two derivative theories from the conventional um, language are, are ones with minus minus plus and the other way around. And so there are these extremely simple expressions that amongst other things, for example, tells you that the three particle amplitude for gravity is the square of the three particle amplitude for Yang Mills. This is a totally unobvious fact from staring at the Lagrangians for GR or uh, Yang Mills. Uh, and there's another amusing feature is that these three particle amplitudes appear to have sort of poles in them. Uh, if the spin is bigger than zero, they have these uh, kind of objects uh, downstairs. Um, that's important because now the, the three particle amplitudes are completely determined by symmetries, but now there's a consistency check for four particle scattering, um, which is that uh, the the four particles uh, amplitude, any ions out here for the four particle amplitude, it has to have poles in a particular spot. In some of two momenta can go on shell, uh, interpreted as uh, producing the the on shell intermediate particle, and in the neighborhood of that pole, the residue on that pole has to be interpreted as the amplitude for producing the intermediate state. Uh, from the initial state that then goes out to the final state and produces uh, uh, the friend on the other side. So this is a very simple mathematical requirement on the uh, four particle amplitude. Uh, uh, easiest to implement if we imagine we have a weak coupling so we're working at something at the uh, tree level. And so, but we see very directly the physics of locality that tells us where the poles are, unitarity that tells us that the four particle amplitude has to factorize on the poles in a consistent way. And now, because the three particle amplitudes are completely determined by, uh, by, by symmetries up to the coupling constants from before, this is just a well posed mathematical problem. So, for instance, if you compute the, you imagine you have particles of uh, all particles of uh, spin S. And I just compute what the residue would be in the S channel by just taking the product of these two three particle amplitudes uh, up to some overall factors that just take care of the correct weights. You see this interesting feature that it looks like one over T to the power of the spin of the particle. So it's not obvious that this could make sense. If we have spin zero, then, uh, th th then this factor isn't there. All these residues are just equal to G squared. And so there's trivial to build a four particle amplitude that has the correct factorization property. You just multiply this residue by one over S plus one over T plus one over U. But it's not obviously that it's consistent if you go uh, to higher spin. So for instance, if I take a single particle of spin one, then, the, then by the structure of this residue, the most general four particle amplitude that I could have can look like this. Uh, and I can demand that I match the residues in the S and the T and the U channel. And that just puts these simple restrictions on these coefficients A, B, and C. Uh, they all, all these differences have to equal one and that's clearly inconsistent because if I add all the left-hand sides up, I get zero equals three. Okay, so that's not possible. 
Um, what I can do is have many massless spin one particles. And uh, I have the same structure here, but if there are the number of them, A, B, and C, I'm just gonna call the strength of this, in, the strength of this interaction F, A, B, C. And, uh, and now exactly the same conditions turn into these ones. Um, and now these three equations can have a consistent set of solutions, only if when I add them all up on the left, I get zero. On the right, I'm forced that these Fs have to satisfy the Jacobi identity. So that's how I discover that I can't have a single massless uh, uh, interacting particle of spin one, but I can have many of them consistently interacting, but only if their interaction is, uh, has the uh, diagonal structure. Um, if we go on to a single massless spin two, now, now the same argument gives me a one over T squared in uh, for the uh, residue. And naively, this is very bad because remember, the amplitudes can only have simple poles in S, T, and U. But remember that this is the residue at S equals zero. So uh, T squared when S equals zero is also equal to negative uh, T times U. And so I could write the amplitude as a, with a minus sign, minus uh, G Newton, uh, this uh, uh, numerator that just takes care of all the helicity weights divided by S, T, and U. And now, of course, remarkably, beautifully, clearly by symmetry, that's going to have the correct residues in all the other channels. So we discover it is possible to have a massless uh, uh, self-interacting spin two particle, but you also discover you can't have more than one of them. Um, you can only have one of them, or if you have more than one, they, they, they have to be mutually non-interacting. And if we go on to higher spins in this way, T cubed and so on, there's clearly no way of rescuing that. Um, there's no way of interpreting that as a simple pole in uh, any way. So that's just giving you a flavor of the kind of argument, but it, it turns into a completely well-posed uh, mathematical problem to just work out the consistent possible couplings of the three particle amplitudes. And, um, and, uh, and you can really very directly from this simple four particle consistency check, deduce this fact that relativity and quantum mechanics tells you that if you have massless particles with spin, uh, then their leading interactions uh, are only consistent for theories of uh, spin zero, one half, one, three halves, and two. And then if it's a, if you do have the massless spin two uh, with the leading interactions and it's unique and, and it's, it has to be described by uh, GR, you can have up to eight of the massless spin three half guys and that's a structure of supergravity. You can have the massless spin one guys that's forced out of the angle structure. And all these things are simply forced on you by the, uh, by the consistency of relativity and quantum. So this is very much in the vein of the Weinbergian sort of inevitability <laughs> Um, uh, and is, uh, is the more modern way of uh, talking about um, uh, the uh, uh, same things from a, a very similar starting point, but making a, but making a, a larger departure from the uh, standard formalism very early on by just simply refusing to talk about local quantum fields. Uh, let me just make a couple of other comments about gravity as an, an, an effective theory. Of course, uh, gravity is famously non-normalizable, but that's one of the points of view about effective field theories that we can sensibly talk about it in the energy expansion. And as Howard emphasized, um, uh, that, that means that uh, even in a non-normalizable theory, the non-analytic um, quantum logarithms are calculable. So we can talk, for instance, about a, 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 a uh, a graviton loop correction to a two-point function that might look like just by a units g newton times p to the fourth with some constant a plus b log p squared plus dot 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 the a piece which is not uh the a piece is a uh, totally unknown uv physics but the part proportional to the logarithm the b is completely calculable in the low energy theory and uh the the position space avatar of this is that if we look at uh the, the shift in, for example, the, uh, the potential that we would get from such such a correction, the piece proportional to A would just give me a contact term, uh, just a delta cubed of R, um, while the piece proportional to B would still be tiny, but it would be a power law. We'll go like L Planck squared over R cubed. It's a tiny but uh, calculable long distance effect. Similarly, I can, for example, talk about photon-photon uh, scattering uh, mediated with gravitons uh, in the middle. And this is a totally calculable quantum gravity uh, uh, computation. Okay? All these pieces with logs are calculable. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, exactly what I mean by this cutoff, those pieces are not calculable. And those would add up to one of these contact terms that I can't calculate. It's coming from a higher dimension operator in the standard effective field theory language. But all the coefficients of the logs are calculable. 
So these are examples of calculable quantum gravity uh, corrections. Of course, gravity is special. Um, so having said all this, gravity is special. There are many ways in which gravity is uh, special. Uh, there are some very important qualitative ones. For example, we know that uh, if we talk about extremely high energy scattering in gravity, we eventually make black holes. Uh, and when the energies get parametrically larger than M Planck, the center of mass energy gets parametrically larger than M Planck, the black holes that we make grow in size. They get bigger and bigger. Similarly, there are entropy bounds that uh, tell us that the maximum entropy in a region of space scales like the area in Planck units versus what we'd expect from a local quantum field theory, which is the volume in the units of some uh, ultraviolet color. Um, uh, other structural things, there are no precise local observables in a theory that has uh, quantum mechanics and gravity. Uh, a very precise um, uh, uh, notion of uh, how different gravity is, is that while we can imagine all sorts of other effective field theories are actually the low energy limit of some underlying quantum field theory, uh, a graviton in D dimensions cannot be a composite particle from some kind of local quantum field theory dynamics in D dimensions. Uh, this is the weinberg witten theorem. And actually we saw an Ansel avatar of this uh, um, a moment ago when, when, I, when I said that we can't have multiple massless spin two particles uh, interacting with each other. If you could have some underlying uh, four dimensional uh, theory that produces a massless spin two particle at low energies, then you could also weakly couple that underlying theory to, to gravity. And that would give you a theory of multiple interacting massless spin two particles, which we know we're not allowed to have. Okay, so all these things make gravity special. And um, like all uh, great no-go theorems, the weinberg witten theorem has a very famous and important counterexample, which is that we've discovered that the graviton in D plus one dimensions can be a composite particle from local quantum field theory dynamics in D dimensions um, uh, in, in the uh, gauge gravity duality between field theory uh, in D dimensions and uh, theory of gravity or strains, et cetera, in anti de Sitter space in one higher dimension. All right, uh, so um, let me now for the last uh, 10 minutes of my talk, um, turn to uh, the issue of the cosmological constant. Um, and uh, as we all know, and as Weinberg uh, well appreciated, the cosmological constant is a sort of a crushing weight on the notions of naturalness that have um, uh, that, that, that drove a lot of thinking in particle physics for uh, uh, many decades. And uh, one of the first things that uh, Weinberg did in this um, uh, business is to actually sh uh, show how much of a crushing weight it was uh, by, by, by giving some very simple no-go arguments for why there can't be easy dynamical adjustment mechanisms uh, to make the uh, to explain the smallness of the cosmological constant. So, for example, you might uh, you might look for some theory that has gravity in a bunch of other fields. Um, you're looking for a vacuum solution, so you uh, you're looking for a flat space vacuum solution. So you're looking for a solution where the g mu nu is a, a, a constant in space. The other fields are a constant in space. And uh, could it be that if I take the the trace of the equation of motion for gravity, which would give me the cosmological constant, that that there's, there's, a, there's some reason why that's actually a linear combination of the equation of motion for the other fields. See, if that was possible, then putting the, X, the, other, uh, the, the matter fields on shell would force the cosmological constant to equal zero. And there are many examples that people have tried of uh, building sort of dynamical adjustment mechanisms of this sort. And Weinberg um, disposed of them all in one shot uh, with the following very simple argument that, um, if such a thing was possible, then it's equivalent to, to the uh, uh, the Lagrangian, at least on the configurations where all the fields are space-time constant, having the following symmetry that you can think of as a scale invariance. Uh, if you take all of these fields, you can just uh, 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 you can uh, uh, divide them up into the ones that are charged into the symmetry and the ones that are not. The one that's charged into the symmetry is some some uh, scalar phi, and the symmetry tells it tells you that g mu nu and phi have to come together in this combination g mu nu e to the two phi. So phi really looks like a dilaton, and uh, then the Lagrangian evaluated on the constant field can just be this root g hat times some constant v naught, but that's uh, that gives you a potential for this scalar phi. Uh, and so either V naught is equal to zero, in which case you haven't done anything, you're still fine tuning the cosmological constant, or you have a runaway potential for the, for the deleton phi that either drags all the mass scales to zero or to infinity. In any case, that's a no-go theorem for a simple adjustment mechanisms for the cosmological constant. Um, Weinberg didn't explicitly talk about this, but, uh, but you can also ask whether it's, um, uh, there are 
uh, ways to get rid of just the vacuum energy part of the energy momentum tensor. And, and it's also easy to see that, that you can't do something like that in a, in a simple way. And, and that's because uh, if I take uh, any uh, homogeneous energy momentum tensor, um, there's a part of it, uh, I can't uniquely decompose it into matter part, radiation part, and cosmological constant part locally. Um, uh, but we know that the matter and the radiation part have to gravitate normally. We're trying to sort of get rid of this part and say that, that, that it behaves differently, but there's no local way of deciding which part is cosmological constant and which part is uh, everyone else. Uh, you need a causality. You need to, what, what's special about the cosmological constant is it's the part of the energy momentum that survives deep into the future. Um, and so there's no local mechanism of this sort either that can uh, degravitate the vacuum energy. Of course, famously, Weinberg gave us a totally different sort of explanation for the smallness of the cosmological constant. And in Weinberg's anthropic argument, you imagine uh, what the universe would look like if we did nothing, uh, kept everything fixed, but we made the cosmological constant uh, more natural by making it more natural, by making it a lot more positive or a lot more negative. And Weinberg's striking observation in uh, 87 um, was that if you made the cosmological constant just a little bigger, between 10 to 100 times uh, bigger than what it was eventually found to be, uh, back then the upper, the abound today what was eventually found to be, then uh, then the universe, if I make it uh, bigger and positive, it it, it it accelerates so much that the accelerated expansion rips apart galaxies uh, before they have a chance to form. Similarly, if the cosmological constant was too negative, then the universe would recollapse and crunch before galaxies can form. And so if you imagine in, that uh, all possible values of the cosmological constant are somehow sampled um, in some way, then it's not surprising that we should find ourselves in the places of the universe that's uh, either empty or dead. <laughs> Um, and this argument, uh, Weinberg phrased it as a way of ruling out anthropic reasoning, but, um, but it did correctly predict the non-zero value of the cosmological constant, not far from what, where it was uh, eventually found. Um, uh, I want to say that this, uh, uh, this argument actually tells us more. First, um, uh, it, it, it predicts, in addition to just the size of the cosmological constant, it sort of makes a parametric prediction. Uh, that if uh, it, uh, that you could imagine verifying at any point in the history of the universe, that if you look at how the matter, radiation, and cosmological constants scale with time, there should be an epoch where these three lines meet each other. Okay, um, and and furthermore, in uh, uh, and that's that's because uh, in order for structure to form, first matter has to dominate over radiation, uh, and then uh, and then uh, the cosmological constant uh, should not be. Uh, bigger than that scale uh, in order to allow galaxies to form. So, so roughly uh, all three things, uh, sh there, there should be an epoch where all three things happen at the same time. And actually in slightly more detail, um, uh, because uh, we have small density perturbations, in order for galaxies to form, we have to have some time for the structure to grow. So there has to actually be a little bit, a little gap between when the clumping starts and when the cosmological constant finally takes over. So this is the parametric prediction for the scale uh, associated with the cosmological constant to be given by the temperature at matter radiation equality, uh, further scaled by this factor of delta rho over rho, uh, the density perturbations of the three quarters. Um, this logic also can, if, if, you, if you imagine that we have dark matter and dark matter wimps, it also explains another interesting numerological sort of coincidence that many people have remarked on, which is this, um, uh, which is the, 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 the mystery of the equidistant scales that the uh, weak scale appears to be the geometric mean of the scale associated with the cosmological constant and the Planck scale. Uh, and uh, the reason for this is that if we have uh, dark matter as a thermal relic, uh, by the usual freeze-out calculation, again, going back to Weinberg, we can uh, estimate what the temperature at matter radiation uh, equality is, is given simply by one over the annihilation cross-section for dark matter in Planck units. And so that's something like m dark matter squared over some alpha squared associated with the annihilation, some weak, weak coupling factors alpha squared m Planck. Um, uh, so Weinberg tells us that we have to have uh, uh, the, the scale of the cosmological constant set by matter radiation Matter radiation is given by this formula, so it's roughly m dark matter squared over m Planck. And if we imagine that dark matter is given by WIMPs, particles actually near the weak scale, then we would get, the, uh, we would understand why the scale of the cosmological constant uh, is related to the weak scale and the Planck scale in this geometric mean way. Now, uh, there are some theoretical support to this. Uh, to this picture. Um, 
Uh, and uh, which, uh, of course, uh, famously people polemically debated um, uh, a great deal in the early 2000s. Um, one is that uh, string theory is, is a prime example of what, what a unique underlying theory could look like, but which has an enormous landscape of let's call it 10 to the thousands of metastable non-supersymmetric vacuum. And just to sort of push the point and, and decouple it from the, uh, from the complications of string theory, there's a toy model for what's going on. Imagine the, the Lagrange in the world is unique, but really unique, but it's the standard model plus n scalar fields and n decoupled scalar fields. Each one of them has a potential that looks like this, but all the potentials are a little bit different. So the Lagrangian is unique. We have, uh, let's say, a thousand scalars, not so many. We already have 100 degrees of freedom in, in the standard model. But the point is that uh, even though the Lagrangian is unique, we'll have two to the n different possible values of the energy, depending on which minimum the scalar finds itself in for each one of these different guys. And so simply statistically, there's going to be one of them within two to the minus n, uh, the ultraviolet scale of the theory of, of, of the origin. Okay, so, so that's an example of how we can get, uh, even with a unique theory, a huge number of different, um, an exponentially large number of different uh, possible metastable vacua, enough to sort of finally uh, uh, scan all the uh, uh, many different possible values of the cosmological constant. And um, uh, the second piece of theoretical support is from cosmology that eternal inflation gives a plausible mechanism for, uh, for populating the landscape. Now, of course, it's suspicious that uh, we would be um, invoking the presence of all these vacua out there beyond our cosmological horizon uh, in order to explain something about uh, what we see inside our cosmological horizon. And especially ironic that to try to explain the tiny size of our observed vacuum energy, we would be um, talking about uh, things that are outside our cosmological horizon that are literally made impossible to see by that very acceleration whose, whose tininess we're trying to explain by invoking. But uh, so that's uh, suspicious. But on the other hand, it could be like that we're on the inside of a black hole. Uh, after all, being inside this accelerating uh, um, universe is a little bit like being on the inside of a black hole. And so could it be the things that are that we that we naively think are there outside the black hole are encoded in some scrambled way in physics that we can in principle access inside. So that's uh, something like that is expected to be the case uh, to resolve the black hole information paradox. So maybe there's maybe maybe something like that would make sense in cosmology as well. Let's just say that it's not obvious either way whether this is garbage or not. Uh, to, uh, to uh, talk about all these vacua outside in order to try to explain something inside. I also want to stress, though, that uh, there's an aspect of this physics that is not metaphysics. Um, if we go back to this toy example of n scalars, imagine that was the actual model. Um, uh, those scalars can, in principle, be seen by experiments in our universe. So you could, in principle, with a high enough energy accelerator, make all these scalars, confirm that the potential looks like this, uh, you could even build bubbles of the other vacua, small bubbles of the other vacua in principle, verify the couplings vary by shooting things into these bubbles and seeing them come out. So this part is not metaphysics. It's in principle possible from measurements in one universe to conclude that your theory is such that it gives you an exponentially large number of metastable vacua. And if we saw something like that, it would clearly change our thinking about, uh, about um, uh, naturalness problems. The part that we don't know how to make sense of is the sense in which these states are or aren't out there somewhere beyond our cosmological world. All right. Now, um, but uh, what? But we're, we're unlikely to do this anytime soon, obviously, have uh, big enough accelerators that could uh, see all of these different, um, uh, to, to, to produce all these other states and make these bubbles of the other vacuum and so on. Uh, so I think the, what, what, what we can do is think if this way of thinking could impact any other aspect of our thoughts about, uh, um, about high energy physics. And there's the obvious uh, question going back uh, and the obvious uh, suggestion going back to very nice arguments of Donahue and others. Um, uh, could there be anthropic explanations for the Higgs mass? And there is a very natural one that if we, again, uh, leave everything the same and we make the Higgs mass squared more natural by making it more negative, let's say, then if the Higgs valve just gets three times bigger than the observed value, then we don't have atoms, a plural anymore, because the neutron proton binding energy, the down quark gets so much heavier than the up quark 
that the mass splitting between the neutron and the proton exceeds nuclear binding energies. And so we don't have anything other than hydrogen. Okay, so, uh, so if we make the Higgs bev much bigger, just by a factor of three, the, the long distance world changes in a dramatic way. We don't have all this interesting chemistry. That's an accident of where the, where the Higgs is. This is not remotely as, 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 uh, as compelling as Weinberg's argument, but it's still rather striking. In the opposite direction, if you make the Higgs mass squared more positive, um, then, uh, then QCD breaks electroweak symmetry, and you can show that, uh, that all baryons are wiped out by scaleron processes in a world like that. So there is something uh, interesting that if we take the standard model and we imagine making uh, the two parameters that are fine-tuned, uh, if we make the cosmological constant a little bigger, and the Higgs mass squared a little bigger, it's striking that, that the world changes dramatically, that it's either empty in the cosmological constant side or no atoms on the Higgs mass squared side. And this is striking, it didn't have to be. And um, uh, it's a true fact, it's a true fact that would just be a curious fact in the unique vacuum worldview, but you could take it as evidence that somehow the existence of a landscape could actually impact not just uh, and not just uh, our understanding of the cosmological constant, but also of the hierarchy problem and the origin of the Higgs mass. And this is, after all, the, the, the sort of cent central tension of beyond the standard model physics um, has been between arguments that say that naturalness for the Higgs is correct. We have the picture of supersymmetry, the beautiful unification of coupling constants, dark matter that just fall in our laps on the one side versus indications for unnaturalness on the other side, that there is no such argument for the cosmological constant. From the very beginning, we didn't have evidence for play between neutral currents, electric dipole moments, and so on that should have been there if we had natural solutions to the hierarchy problem. And then, of course, over the past decade, where the hell is everybody? Where are all the particles that are supposed to be there in the usual uh, 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 natural worldview associated with the Higgs? And for me, uh, Weinberg's argument um, extended to possibly thinking about uh, anthropic origin of the Higgs um, uh, gave uh, made it possible to entertain this possibility, which is at least my own picture. If someone woke me up in the middle of the night, put a gun to my head and said, what I think is going on. I think what's going on is some version of minimal split Susie, which is a very particular realization of supersymmetry, uh, which is very unusual from the standard point of view where the scalars are a, a parametric loop factor a hundred or a thousand times heavier than the fermions. Um, in this picture, we still retain the successes of supersymmetric unification, dark matter. We get rid of all the phenomenological problems associated with the flavor chain, neutral currents, and so on. Um, the, uh, the bottom of the spectrum should be near the TEV scale to be dark matter, but that could mean, in the simplest picture for dark matter, something between 1 to 3 TEV, uh, which would, would be very easy to miss at the LHC, but would be accessible to 100 TV collider. Um, this picture did correctly predict that the Higgs mass should lie in this range between 120 GeV and 135 GeV. It's a very mild prediction, but at least it wasn't wrong. Uh, and what, what I want to stress, though, is that this is, this is a picture of the world which we could imagine getting evidence for from experiments, um, which would be completely crazy without the landscape, but would be uh, quite plausible. I was I was going to put that Weinberg was my hero and ideal in theoretical physics, but he really continues to be my hero and ideal in uh, theoretical physics. And he somehow struck the perfect balance, as, as Ricardo also said uh, in, in, in the very first talk, between a direct contact uh, with experiment and phenomenology on the one hand, but a uh, strong tide of formalism, but not just formalism for doodling around for doodling around sake, but formalism with a deep physical point on the other. And he managed to combine this style to be right about the real world, the actual world when we, we look at, when we see outside our window over and over again. And I hope, uh, and I'm sure that his example will serve as an, an inspiration for us for uh, uh, decades to come. Thank you. Mm -hmm.